Without further ado, I give you our next speaker, Jacob Abu Hamada. Jacob is a master's degree candidate at Hood College who has intertwined his passion for the study of human behavior with a lifelong investigation of religion, music, and psychology to explore human cognition. Please welcome to the TEDx Hood College stage, Jacob Abu Hamada. I'm sure you're wondering why a talk about the nature of the mind just began with guitar playing. But consider the experience. Was the experience surprising, unexpected? Maybe it was activating or could have even just been boring. <laughs> Everyone in this room witnessed the same event, my playing guitar on this stage, and it was a little different for everybody. This is to say nothing of the experience of waking up this morning compared to now, or the experience of falling in love, the experience of going to the bathroom, the experience of taking psychedelics or stubbing your pinky toe, or any of the many experiences that we've heard tonight. <laughs> All these experiences seem so radically different, and yet they are part of the same mind. How can we integrate and bring together into a single cohesive framework or understanding such radically different experiences. Well, in the field, there's this kind of assumption that the brain sciences, that is neuroscience, will uncover the workings of the brain, and that in turn, this should yield an understanding of the mind. Now, this feels wrong to me. It feels like assuming that an understanding of the workings of computer hardware automatically translates to an understanding of the software. Obviously, this isn't true. I think anyone who owns a smartphone can tell you that this isn't true. <laughs> All the different sub-disciplines of psychology, they don't really share much of the same language as they refer to different aspects of the mind. They talk about social relationships, personality, mental illness, psychopharmacology, transpersonal experiences, there are no foundational frameworks that serve to ground or unify all these diverse perspectives. And this disunity of psychology, I would argue, is the greatest struggle or challenge that it faces as a science. Now, is this disunity just what happens to all the sciences as our knowledge of them grows? Well, with physics, we have the standard model, which describes how all the fundamental particles of matter and energy interact and the forces which govern their interaction within this systematic organizational framework. Biology has Darwinian evolution by natural selection, bolstered by our understanding of genetics, and allowing us to piece together the entire tree of life and how all living, living things are related. With chemistry, we have the periodic table, of course, again, another systematic organizational framework which serves to ground and unify all the constituent parts. Now, if we place all the sciences on a spectrum, but from fragmented and disunified on the left, like alchemy, to the integrated understanding, such as chemistry, on the right, we see biology and physics aren't far behind chemistry, but psychology still lags over here to the left. So how can we push it to the right? What can we do to improve the language or the nomenclature of psychology to elevate it and integrate it as a science. Now, I maintain that if the common element of all sub psychological phenomena is that of the individual subjective experience, i.e. a sentient conscious mind, then it serves to reason that 
to integrate or create a truly comprehensive theory of psychology, we should endeavor to place subjective experience at the very center. Now, how do we do this? <laughs> My approach was to take all of the different models that I could find from psychology and start piecing them together, like pieces of a puzzle. So first, I encountered Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I'm sure most of you are somewhat familiar. But before long, I encountered other hierarchical models, uh, epitomized by Ken Wilber, who, uh, with his integral psychology uh, concept of the levels of consciousness, demonstrated how you could show the correlations between all of these different hierarchical models. From Buddhism, I learned of the nine stages of settling the mind in shamatha meditation. In my undergrad, I encountered Roland Fisher's cartography of the ecstatic and meditative states. You got uh, aroused states like anxiety leading to hyper aroused states and ultimately ecstatic rapture on the left there. And then on the right, we have uh, relaxation leading to meditation and ultimately samadhi on the right. Very cool not a cartography. This is another one-dimensional framework. But I found my first two-dimensional framework from the concept of flow in positive psychology. We've got on the Y axis, challenge level against skill level, and flow states represent those experiences where the level of skill, a high level of skill, is matched to a high level of challenge. So all right, individually, each of these is good, but not perfect or comprehensive but we should not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Obviously, there's utility. So let's start piecing them together. We can start with flow, since it's two-dimensional. We can superimpose Fisher's cartography right on top there. The Buddhist stages fit on top of his cartography. And then the hierarchical models fit neatly along this x-axis. This was the point five years ago when I realized, huh, I think, I think there's something here. Now it looks like this. <laughs> and don't worry, we're going to break it down. OK, so we've got executive cognitive functioning on the x-axis there. Now, on the low end, you have states uh, with minimal self-control, uh, self-awareness, a lack of effective functioning in given, any given context. Uh, states like dissociation, depression, psychosis, or panic attacks. And if you go low enough, you just fall asleep. <laughs> On the high end, we have the theoretical maximum for effective functioning, hyperlucidity, flow states, and meditation. On the y-axis, we have intensity of experience or activation. Now, this is made up of the collection of your five senses plus your thoughts and your feelings. On the low end, relaxation, meditation, and sleep. On the high end, we have hyper-aroused states again. We have mania, we have uh, psychosis and ecstatic trance, anxiety and flow. But we can also extend it into the third dimension by adding effective valence. Now this one is the easiest to understand. This is just, do you feel good or do you feel bad overall right now? Now let's consider uh, a model that you should all be fairly familiar with from your doctor, and that's the one through 10 pain scale. Now we can project it here into this Z dimension, and that shows us the negative states or suffering. But this isn't the full picture of pain, is it? Because as you increase on the pain scale, you're increasing the intensity of your experience, Y, while also decreasing your capacity for effective functioning. So really it looks more like this. There's another dimension we have to consider, that's time. Because without considering time, any number of other dimensions is only gonna give you a snapshot of a person. If we can't model them throughout time, we can't see how they change in different contexts. Um, yeah, in different contexts. So let's illustrate this. Let's say that you wake up and you're feeling lethargic. So you eat breakfast, you shower, and now you're feeling more awake, but you had a little bit too much coffee. So now you're kind of activated, you're keyed up. You decide to put that energy to good use. So you get down to work and you're able to be pretty engaged with it. But after some time, you need to take a break. So you relax, you go outside, you're relaxing, and I'm feeling a little better. And then, oh crap, you just realized you were supposed to be on a phone call with your boss 10 minutes ago. Now you're having a, a borderline <laughs> panic attack. 
And then you're rushing into the phone, and then you realize, oh, wait a minute, that's for tomorrow. <laughs> so now you're relaxed. So we've got three dimensions and time. What else can we do with it? Well, we've got mental illness. Let's take that as an example. So mental illness is typically defined as disordered or undesirable feeling and or functioning. So we've got feeling on the Y, functioning on the X. Now, over time, everybody's states are going to change. You're going to have states all over this map, like that. <laughs> but we can average all of these states together. And if we do so, a healthy individual would likely fall somewhere near the center there. If you have depression, you'll fall here. If you have two clusters of experiences in these two regions, indicative of bipolar disorder. Here would be anxiety disorders and psychotic disorders, like, like schizophrenia. Now, notice that this removes the need for diagnostic labeling, which reduces the sense of difference or stigma between so-called healthy individuals and those struggling with mental illness. What else can we do with this? Well, let's consider psychoactive drugs. <laughs> stimulants. This is a map of stimulants here. So if we start from the center, as you increase the dose of the stimulant, you follow those arrows. And like, let's take coffee, for example. It can activate you. It can help you focus. It might give you anxiety, but it's not going to cause you to dissociate. Hallucinogens look like this. We have antipsychotics or tranquilizers. And cannabinoids, the active compounds found in cannabis. Now, let's take these two applications of uh, tracking mental illness and the effects of psychoactives. Let's put them together. And let's use it to diagnose and to treat Piglet from Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> let's treat his generalized anxiety. So let's say Piglet starts mindfulness meditation, and it helps a little bit, but not enough. So he goes to his family doctor, who prescribes him a powerful sedative. <laughs> it helps, but maybe a little too much, because now he's starting to resemble Eeyore. <laughs> so the doctor reduces the dose, and it's helping tremendously. But he also suggests that Piglet go to counseling to address his anxious thought and behavioral patterns. We see now, he's thriving. What else can we do? Well, let's go really off the wall and consider a completely different psychological system entirely. Let's consider Buddhist psychology. We can readily adapt them to this model as well. So we have meditative states, which we've touched on. Um, but there's also, in some branches of Buddhism, tantric states. These are tantric meditative practices. I call them hyperflow. Um, they involve intense, sustained visualizations that are highly complex, and there are actually parallels uh, to these practices that exist in all the major world religions. In meditation, where uh, Buddhists are taught to guard against excitation and laxity, because these are the two forces that pull us out of the meditation. Either your mind gets excited with thoughts, or you become lethargic and groggy and fall asleep. Hyperlucid states correspond to what Buddhism would term enlightened states. Maximal effective functioning paired with a transcendence of the sense of self or ego. We can even represent the abstract concept of compassion. So let's start with sympathy. Um, and let's imagine that uh, you've got a coworker who's depressed. And you can react to that coworker. Maybe it, you get uh, irritated by the fact for some reason. Or maybe you're anxious because you think you're worried that uh, you're going to have to pick up their slack. Or maybe you just have no reaction whatsoever. You're unfazed. By contrast, empathy is where we see a mirroring of the experience of the other person. So for instance, you know, your friend is depressed. Now you're depressed too. But with compassion, there's a simultaneous holding of your state of consciousness with the state of the other person. That allows you to have more effective action to alleviate their suffering. I call these multi-vectored states, uh, I call them complex experiences. And here we see another example, wisdom. Now in Buddhism, Buddhism uh, considers uh, wisdom and compassion to be two sides of the same hand. And indeed, if you think about it, wisdom 
a fundamental characteristic of wisdom, is the ability to simultaneously hold many diverse perspectives separate from your own. All right, so let's return to, oh yeah, and uh, of course, there's definitely a, a lot of resemblance between the structures there. <laughs> let's return to the beginning of the talk when I played the guitar. This was my experience, or roughly. Activation, a little bit of anxiety, leading to a flow state, and then back to center. Your experiences of my playing could have been anywhere in this space. I mean, you might have been dissociating. You might have been excited or surprised. Maybe you were relaxed. Maybe you were highly focused. Consider what something like this could do to change social conversations by having a point of quantifiable comparison to demonstrate the differences between the subjective experiences of different demographic groups. Or think about how it might uh, develop new means of, of, of creating diagnostic categories. How might it empower individuals to seek, as well as providers to facilitate, the best psychiatric care? What might be the cross-fertilization effects by translating concepts between Western and Eastern psychological systems? How might this help artists and writers and philosophers and researchers to have a searchable library of experiences? How might it help you to have a map of your mind? Thank you. <laughs>